Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he declares that Jesus holds everything together, from the majestic to the microscopic and everything in between, work and family, friendships and faith. In this series, Pastor Skip explores the practical application of Jesus' preeminence so we can make sure that Jesus is at the center of it all. Always only Jesus, Good morning. So my name is Skip. I'm your guest speaker today. It's good to be here. Would you turn in to your Bibles, please? Did you bring one of these? Always a good thing to have a church, a Bible. Uh, so turn in your Bible, please, to uh, the book of Colossians, chapter 1. As you're turning to Colossians 1, if you haven't already, just a little word. Wednesday nights, we're back in our Through the Bible series. We're in 1 Corinthians finishing, 1 Corinthians, this has been that long, um, uh, chapter 15, we want to finish that chapter up this week. If you've ever wondered what your resurrected body is going to be able to do or look like, come Wednesday night. Now, you don't have to come. I'm inviting you to come. It's going to happen to you anyway. It's just nice to know what's going to happen so you're not surprised when it does. So uh, that'll be Wednesday night in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But today, we're in Colossians chapter 1. Now, I lived through an era of American history known as the Jesus Movement, when we did say Maranatha to each other all the time. It was a, a revival-like atmosphere that moved from coast to coast. It had a very unique feature, the Jesus Movement attracted lots of young people. At one time, I was a young person, believe it or not. And I was part of that whole movement that started in California on the West Coast and went uh, across the country. And thousands upon thousands of young people were coming to know Jesus Christ. Well, since those days of the Jesus movement, there have been documentaries that have been produced uh, books that have been written, um, dissertations for PhDs as to why the Jesus movement took place. What were the things that caused it to take place? So some have tried to explain that it was because of incredible leaders that emerged like Chuck Smith or Arthur Blessett, uh, people like that. Others have said it was the music. Uh, we got tired of choir music and organ music and we went to more modern expressions. Uh, people like Larry Norman, or Love Song, or Phil Keggy, Paul Clark, the Maranatha bands uh, created a lot of that. Uh, others said, well, the reason was is that, you know, in the West Coast there's such a, a laid-back atmosphere, sort of a hippie atmosphere that was permeating the culture, and so the young kids sort of gravitated toward those expressions. Still others said it was a reaction to the international problems as well as national problems. So the Vietnam War uh, was one of those international problems, along with a very difficult and toxic political atmosphere like Watergate in our own country. And so the ultimate countercultural expression of all of that, they say, was the Jesus movement. Well, I was there. And uh, I'll say this, those may be features, they may have been contributing factors and components for the Jesus movement, but I'm here to tell you the real reason for the Jesus movement was Jesus. He was moving. Aslan was on the move. It was something uniquely sovereignly that God was doing in our world, where people were saying basically no to religion and a resounding yes to the person of Jesus. Now, not everybody liked it, and I would say the established churches did not like it. So where I was in Orange County, California, uh, 
the local paper, I believe it was the Orange County Register, put out an article citing one of the local pastors in the area that was seeing all these young kids going to this crazy church called Calvary Chapel. And he said in, in a sort of a deprecating, snidely remark, he said, well, all they have is Jesus. <laughs> what a statement. All they have is Jesus. How about this? All they need is Jesus. But not everybody thinks Jesus is enough. Some think Jesus is good to start with, but you, you need more than Jesus. You need Jesus and a little more ceremony or a little more ritual or a little more structure or a little more this or that. It's interesting. When I, when I moved from the West Coast and I moved east, that's what I called moving to Albuquerque. I'm going back east, I told my friends. And uh, I came here and... Um, when a couple of local pastors found out that I was here to hopefully start a church, they decided they would come to my rescue. So this is a funny little story. One was a Baptist pastor who found out that we were starting this Bible study, hopefully a church, and he found out that I was not going to take a formal offering, that is, pass the bucket. I was just going to have these crazy little boxes that people can give as the Lord leads them. And he thought, it will fail if you do that. You actually have to have a basket of something in front of them if you're going to ever get this thing going off the ground. So he advised against it, said, don't do the boxes, pass the hat. And, uh, and so he gave me that advice. Uh, another pastor in town thought that I needed to be legitimate so that, that I should wear, he found out he started, it was a Presbyterian pastor. I became friends with both of them. But uh, he found out I was starting a church and he thought, oh my goodness, this poor kid starting a church, he has to be legitimate, so I need to buy him a robe. So imagine me in a robe. What do you think? Can I pull it off? Yeah, yeah. Not going to happen. This, obviously, right? So, um, yeah, he said, Skip, I'm going to buy you a robe. And I put my arm around him. I said, look, I appreciate the gesture, but no. Um, but he thought, yeah, but you need that or it's really not going to work. Well, with all of that kind of anecdotal stuff, I want to get into the book of Colossians. And today, we're going to take a whopping two verses of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. You know, the series is called Always Only Jesus. Now, you might ask, well, why the book of Colossians? I mean, you're, it's a document that was written 2,000 years ago. What possible relevance could it have to our culture? Well, let me tell you why. We live in an age of reason, an age where science is revered by people. Understandably so. 90% of all the scientists who have ever lived in history are alive right now. And there has been an exponential increase in scientific uh, knowledge and discovery. But something has happened. In the pandemic, science has been elevated to savior status. So it's like, follow the science. And what people have meant by that is follow the scientists that we like and agree with. And have you discovered that not all scientists agree with each other? But during that whole pandemic, I noticed that the media liked to pit people of faith against people of science. So what does the Bible have to say about that? Is God outside of science, or is He a part of it? Well, Colossians will give us the answer. In chapter 1, verse 16, all things were created through Him and for Him, and by Him all things are held together. So it's the age of reason. Also, we live in an age of division. The pandemic has divided people ideologically and politically more than I can ever remember. And in the midst of it, people are saying, Jesus is good, but it's certainly not enough. You need more than Him. You need Jesus plus this ideology, or you need Jesus plus our political category, our political slant. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 speaks to that, and you are complete in Him. You're complete in Him. It's always only Jesus. 
So it's an age of reason. It's an age of division. Also, we live in an age of confusion, especially regarding Jesus. Most people today think of Jesus as one of many options in the smorgasbord of religious possibilities. So you've seen this very popular bumper sticker over the last several years where they take the, the icons of different religious systems and they spell the word coexist. Now, you know what the message behind all that is, is, hey, you religious folks, you weird religious people, get along with each other. You're all really saying the same thing. It's all the same God, the same worship system. Get over yourselves. Colossians has something to say about that. It says, He, Jesus, is the image or the exact representation of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, that in all things He might have the preeminence or the supremacy. He is number one, not one among many. So it's not only an age of reason, not only an age of division, it's an age of confusion. And I'll add something else that makes this very applicable. We live in an age of deception. You can't even talk the truth anymore. You, you can't even get a, a, a judge to give you a definition of what a woman is. And if you say, well, this is a woman, that's a man. No, you can't say that because they might not identify as that. And it's gotten so crazy, we're just lying to people. It's an age of deception. And with all of the banter about that comes the idea of what is the role of the family do we even need the family anymore? Colossians chapter 3 will speak to that, husbands and wives and children, etc. So what you need to know is that this town of Colossae that Paul is writing to was a mixed bag of rival philosophies and competing religious systems, and some of that was working its way into the church. There was a constant inflow of ideas from the East and ideas from the West, and it was a perfect spot for heresy to develop. Ever heard the term heresy? Uh, let me just tell you what a heresy is. Heresy uh, means an opinion or belief contrary to what is orthodox or what is commonly held, or, or better yet, what is true, contrary to what is true. So what, what I want to do today is just simply kind of introduce the book to you by looking at these first two verses and a pretty straightforward outline. Paul is writing to the church of Colossae, to the church there, and uh, I, I want you to see the concern for the church, the correspondence to the church, and the character of the church, just those three uh, aspects. First of all, the concern for the church. Paul, verse 1, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know who wrote it. Paul wrote it. Timothy was with him. Pa Timothy didn't help him write it. He's just with him while Paul wrote it. Where did Paul write it from? We believe Paul wrote this letter when he was in jail, which he was in jail a lot, but he was in jail in Rome. He spent two years in Rome, incarcerated under house arrest. Acts chapter 28 says that Paul was allowed to have his own rented house, and people could come to him and converse with him. So he was in jail, and he writes a letter to the church of Colossae because a report has come to Paul's ears about a condition happening in that city. Now get this. Paul did not start the church at Colossae. I know we think, well, Paul started every church. No, he didn't. He did not start the church in Colossae. In fact, Colossae is not mentioned in the book of Acts. There's no record of Paul ever visiting the town at all. He only heard of the work of God in that town. So look down at uh, verse 4. Uh, Since we heard of your faith in Christ and love for the saints. He didn't see it. He heard about it. Go down to verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And then look at chapter 2, 
Verse 1, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and for those in Laodicea, a town next door, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. They'd never seen Paul. Paul had never seen them. He had never been with them because Paul did not start the church of Colossae, listen, directly. Directly. Okay, so if Paul didn't start the church, then what's the next question? Who did? Thank you for asking that question. Who did? Who started the church? Epaphras started the church. He said, Epaphras? Who's that guy? Well, I want to introduce him to you. You're going to get to know Epaphras over the next several weeks and months because he started the church. He started the church. He was from Colossae. So look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Let's, uh, let's just look at a few verses. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ and your love for all the saints. So you're asking yourself, well, Paul, where'd you hear that from? Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth in the gospel, which has come to you as it has in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it also is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from who? Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Now, if you don't mind, go to the last chapter of this book, chapter 4. Again, this is um, the first study in our book, so I want to kind of lay this groundwork. Chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, in other words, he was a Colossian, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, for I bear him witness that he is a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. So how did the church start? By Epaphras. But it was an outgrowth of Paul the Apostle's ministry. I said Paul didn't start the church directly. But listen to this. Paul the Apostle spent three years in a town called Ephesus, about 80 miles to the west of Colossae. Colossae was 80 miles inland on the Lycus River. And while Paul was in Ephesus for three years, for two of those years, he taught in the school of Tyrannus every single day, and he was so effective, Acts chapter 19 tells us, that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Two of those who heard the word of the Lord Jesus were the two guys that started the church. Epaphras is one Philemon was the other. Ever hear of Philemon? There's a book to him in the New Testament. Epaphras started the church. Philemon had the church in his house. It's where the church for a period of time met. Okay, so we know who wrote it. We know who started the church. Why did Paul write this letter to them? He'd never been there, so why does he write a letter to them? Is it just like, hey, dude, uh, this is Paul the Apostle, just checking in, never met you, but what's up? No, Paul is writing as you read this book because a serious problem has developed. And it's so serious that it motivated Epaphras to take a journey from Colossae 1,300 miles to Rome to visit Paul to tell him about the problem. That's motivation because he couldn't just hop on a plane 2,000 years ago and fly to Rome. He couldn't get on a bus and go to Rome or get in his car or motorcycle or bicycle. He had to walk to go to Rome, 1,300 miles. That's how serious it was. The response of Paul the Apostle is the book of Colossians. So what's going on in Colossae? It's what Bob, Bible commentators refer to as the Colossian heresy. The Colossian heresy. A belief system that was a mixture of both Greek philosophy, Greek mysticism, and Jewish legalism. This belief system by the second century AD became known as Gnosticism. It wasn't Gnosticism yet, but it was developing. Ever hear the term Gnosticism? Anybody? Okay, so you've heard 
agnostic, right? You know what that means. Agnostic means somebody who doesn't know. It's literally what it means. I don't know. Is there a God? I don't know. It's agnostic. Gnostic refers to somebody who knows everything. They're in the know. I know. And so a Gnostic was a word that meant we're in the know. You can't know what we know, but we can help you know what we know. But you have to go through these mystical, legalistic kind of formats to get there. True wisdom. That's what they claimed. Now, this belief system grew from a philosophical question. By the way, a question every human being that I've ever met has asked. And the question is, why is there such an evil world if a good God created it? How can there be such an evil world if a good God created it? So they came up with a solution, and there were different elements in this belief system. First of all, they said, well, God is good, but all matter, the material world, is evil. Therefore, God did not create the world. Who did create the world? They said, an emanation that proceeded from God created the world. So they said, thousands upon thousands of emanations, angels, sub-gods, went out from God until there was an emanation so far from God, that emanation didn't even know who God was. That emanation created the material world. Crazy, right? They believed Jesus was an emanation, albeit a good one, like a good angel. But because Jesus was a good emanation and the material world is evil, they said Jesus did not have a physical body. That if you saw somebody walking, it was a phantom that you saw. It wasn't a real material person because a good emanation would never have a material body. So they had all these crazy stories like Jesus would walk on the sand but never leave footprints because he wasn't a real physical body. They also had a mixture of um, Jewish legalism in this belief system, rigid self-denial. They pushed circumcision. They emphasized a certain diet, dietary restrictions, holy days, new moons, festivals. So Paul's answer to all that belief system is this, always, only, Jesus. And Paul will say, Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God with a human body. And in Jesus is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's all that you need. You don't need Jesus plus anything or anyone else. So he is writing this out of concern. Out of concern. Now, I want to say this before we get into the second point. And I want you to really pick up on this. The church, I'm speaking generally in the, the church worldwide, the true church. The church is always in danger. The church is always in danger. There's never not a time when the church is not in danger. There's never a time when the church is not in danger. So in every generation, in every continent, in every place, at all times, the church is facing danger. I made it pretty clear, right? Now, it's pretty easy to understand why that is. Jesus said he would build his church. Paul the Apostle said the church is the pillar and ground of all truth. Um, it, it, and if the church is that, and if the church is at the center of God's plan for humanity, then you can expect Satan to always attack it. Right? If, whatever, if God loves something, the devil hates that. So we like to say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. True, but the devil hates you and has a miserable plan for your life and a miserable plan for the church if you let him. So just like if you uh, eat ice cream and you leave the bowl out overnight, tell me what crawls in the next day or during the night. Ants, they get attracted to that. Ants come. It's sweet. Ants come. You turn on your porch light at night and you come home and you go look at the light. What's flying around the light? Moths, bugs. Just as ants are attracted to the sweet ice cream, just as bugs are attracted to the light, Satan and demons are attracted to the church. 
Just like you learned in school, every action brings an equal and opposite reaction. That's true spiritually. Every act of God is going to bring a counteraction. You are a target of the enemy. Now, we don't deal with Gnosticism. That's not what we are facing. Uh, but uh, there is deconstructionism in the church. There is progressive Christianity in the church. It fights and faces liberalism, and I'm speaking theologically principally, cults in every age. So the church is always in danger. What Paul had a concern for, we shouldn't let our guard down with. So that's first, concern for the church. Second, I want to consider the correspondence to the church. So look at verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. This is beautiful to me. Paul is writing out of concern for the church. Paul knows there's a heresy invading the church. Paul knows this is a bogus system that people are buying into. i got to write something about that. But he doesn't begin his letter he doesn't begin immediately by going after the false teachers and their heresies. He doesn't begin by scolding the church, saying, you guys are a bunch of losers for listening to those knuckleheads. No, he begins by encouraging and affirming faithful believers and by exalting Jesus Christ. The whole chapter is that, chapter 1. So again, in verse 3, knowing the concern that he has, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. In verse 9, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He purposely uses exalted language. Exalted language. Notice that he says, to the saints. Saints, hagias, separated ones. He's saying, y'all are God's children. He's called you, you're saints. By the way, in the New Testament, a saint is not a dead guy with a little halo painted on top of him. Saints are always people who are alive, separated unto God. You're a saint. I'm a saint. I'd like to be called Saint Skip from now on, if you don't mind. <laughs> kind of has a ring to it, don't you think? No, not, not, not really. But you could. Um, we are saints. And then notice the second term, and faithful brethren, one of the loveliest names in the New Testament for a Christian. So uh, once again, Paul doesn't begin by attacking sinners. He begins by affirming saints and faithful brethren. I've noticed that some preachers are always mad. They seem always angry. They've got some bone to pick with something or someone all the time, rebuking anyone who disagrees with them, slamming political leaders, ranting about personal opinions. Ben Franklin said, you're going to catch more flies with honey than you ever will with vinegar. If you want to win people to your cause, be nice, be sweet. It goes a lot further than being rigid and angry and bitter and edgy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. You've heard me and others say for years that you should be known for what you're for more than for what you're against. But I want to add to that and say be known by who it is you're for rather than who it is you're against. Be for Jesus. Be Jesus always and only. And you do that by exalting Christ and encouraging his people. So yes, the church is always in danger, but God's true church is always around also. So whenever there are problems or false doctrines or 
aberrant and errant activities. There's also faithful, mature believers that you can appeal to. Perhaps this is best noticed in the words of Jesus himself. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus writes, you remember this, seven letters to seven churches? We call them letters, really. They're like little postcards, just a few lines to each of these churches in Asia Minor. But it's Jesus' words. In each of those little postcards, Jesus points at a problem and is picking at that problem, makes known to them, there's a problem. But in every single letter, he also makes an appeal and a promise to somebody he calls the overcomer. The overcomer. Every letter. So to the church of Ephesus, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life. To the church of Smyrna, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. To the church at Pergamos, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. To the church at Thyatira, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. To the church of Sardis, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. To the church at Philadelphia, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And to the church at Laodicea, he who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. In every letter, Jesus is giving a promise to the saints and faithful brethren or as he calls them, the overcomers. Maybe, just maybe, we should celebrate the saints more than worry about all the ain'ts. Instead of getting mad because they're not coming to church, how about love on those who overcome in church? The faithful ones. Build them up. Speak to the saints and the faithful brethren. I fear that some people are more concerned with false brethren than they are with faithful brethren. So, to the saints and faithful brethren is his correspondence. Now, something else, just notice quickly. We we don't have time. I I, I can get carried away in any of these um, areas. But uh, notice that he is writing to a group of people that has not one but two addresses. They are brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Do you know that the child of God has dual citizenship? We carry two passports. We have a heavenly passport. We are citizens of heaven, says in Philippians, but we also should be responsible citizens here on earth. So I'm in Albuquerque, but I'm also in Christ. So look at your spiritual address. To the faithful brethren in Christ... This is very unique. 87 times the New Testament says we are in Christ. And Paul uses them most of the time. I think Peter does twice, Luke once, but he's quoting Paul. So really, this is Paul's deal. You are in Christ. This is unique because no world religion ever talks that way. You will never hear a Muslim say, I am in Muhammad. You'll never hear a Mormon say, I'm in Joseph Smith, or a Jewish person, I'm in Moses, or a Buddha say, I'm in Buddha, but you hear Christians say, I'm in Christ, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So we have the life of Jesus in us, and our life is wrapped up in Him. We are in Christ. Um, I'm going to share with you a letter that is pretty old. Um, It goes back to the second century A.D., so it's almost as old as the Bible. Uh, It is part of the epistle to Diognetus, uh, who was an unbelieving Roman government official. Some believe that he was the guy who tutored one of the Caesars of Rome. But it's explaining the presence of Christians in the Roman Empire. I want you to see it. Christians are not marked out from the rest of mankind by their country or their speech or customs. They dwell in cities, both Greek and barbarian, each as his own lot is cast. 
following the customs of the region in clothing and in food and in the outward things of life generally, yet they manifest the wonderful and openly paradoxical character of their own state. They inhabit the land of their birth, but as temporary residents thereof, they take their share of all responsibilities as citizens and endure all disabilities as aliens. Every foreign land is their native land, and every native land a foreign land. They pass their days upon the earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. That's what it means to be in Christ. Living with that duality, I know I live here and I should be responsible here, but I also know that I have a heavenly home. And keeping that in mind, and and you'll find this in the book, Paul is always drawing our attention to the fact that we have a heavenly home that should always be part of our thought processes. We are in Christ. It's also one of our struggles. And it should be a struggle. The struggle is, how do I honor the Lord, my heavenly address, as a citizen of heaven, being in Christ, at the same time be responsible in a very secular and sometimes anti-God environment? We struggle with that. We should struggle with that. We're meant to struggle with that. Because the Lord Jesus in John 17 said, my prayer, Father, is not that you take them out of this world but that you keep them from the evil one. You see, he made clear that we are in the world, but not of the world. Don't take them out of the world. I want them in the world. I want them here. They're supposed to be here. This is their address. But keep them from the evil one. That's the balance. In fact, on one occasion, if I'd have been there, I think I would have objected. Jesus said to his disciples, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. I'd be the guy who goes, excuse me, Jesus, do you not love us? Why would you send us out in the midst of wolves? You're little lammies. Do you want us to be eaten up by the wolves? No, I want by your presence as my sheep to turn those wolves hopefully into sheep. I'm not looking for your annihilation. I'm looking for their conversion. The only way to do that is send you out in the midst of the wolves. So that's the balance of those two addresses, in Christ, in Colossae. So that's the concern for the church and the correspondence to the church. Let's look at the third aspect, the character of the church, and that is the second part of verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you just let those two words seep into your soul? Grace and peace. That happens to be the basis for living for Jesus Christ in a world that's opposed to Him, is to have the character of grace and peace. Now, I know that you probably know this. When Paul writes grace and peace to you, this is a very typical way to begin a letter. It's a typical salutation. If you looked at an old Roman letter or a piece of papyri, thousands of them begin letters of correspondence exactly the same way. You have the author, you have the recipient, and you have some word of greeting, like rejoice. But what Paul the Apostle uniquely does is he combines the greetings of the Western world and the Eastern world, and he tweaks it a bit. So the common Greek greeting when you saw somebody was kairen. Kairen means rejoice. The Jews see each other, and what do they say when they say hello or goodbye? What do they say? Shalom, which means peace. So the Greeks say kairen, which means rejoice. The Jewish people say peace, coming and going. What Paul does is take them, combine them, and tweak them. What do I mean by tweak? He doesn't say Chiron, he uses the word karis, which is similar. It's part of the root word, but it's a little bit different. So if you're a Greek speaker and you hear this, you go, ah, I see what you did there, Paul. You took one of our greetings, but you made it spiritual. Grace, not rejoice, grace. So grace and peace to you. They happen to be called the Siamese twins of the New Testament. You find them in every letter of Paul the Apostle. 
It's always grace and peace, and they're never reversed. It's never peace and grace. You want to know why? You can never understand the peace of God until you have experienced the grace of God. And when you experience the grace, the unmerited, the undeserved favor, it produces peace. That is the character it produces. So grace is the fountain. Peace is the stream that flows from it. So I want to close by asking you a simple question. Do you have peace? Listen, do you live your daily life with the experience of peace? Or are you filled with torment and anxiety and worry and you're torn at it? Or do you live with peace? Grace and peace. Interesting story. I've always loved it. Caesar Augustus, one of the emperors, heard about a a man in Rome who owed a lot of money. He was in great debt, but he was very peaceful. And every night he slept well on his bed. And Caesar Augustus heard about that, and uh, he told his men, find where he lives and buy his bed. (laughs) Because he was not a peaceful person. He thought the solution is the right sleep number, right? If I had a tempur mattress here at the palace, things would be good. Of course, we know that you don't get peace that way. Peace is the ability to sleep with a clear conscience and heart before God. Having your mind at ease, your heart at ease before God. And perhaps you're not experiencing peace because you haven't yet experienced God's grace. The Barna Group put out a survey a few years ago. They, they asked people. It's a great question, actually. Here's the survey. If you could ask God one question and you knew He would answer you, what would you ask Him? Most people said, I'd like God to explain why there's so much pain and suffering in the world. You would expect that. But a close second was, will there ever be world peace? Will there ever be world peace? Well, I can't, I can't answer if there's ever going to be world peace. I suspect not until Jesus comes. In fact, I'll, I'll just say it, no. <laughs> but I will also say this, there's peace in this part of the world, right here. I experience peace. I, I can be in lots of different situations that are very tough and troubling, but I have peace. And you can have peace in your part of the world. Like we said, Maranatha, hallelujah, up and down, no matter what you're going through, you can have God's peace. The tragedy of our world is that we have people out looking for peace who have never experienced God's grace. And Paul said in Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace can be, should be your experience. But you need to experience God's unmerited favor to get there. Maybe you've never, maybe you've never either turned over the hardship of your life sufficiently to let him handle it. You could be a child of God, tormented. You need to turn over that heartache to him right now. Some of you have never even turned your life over to him yet. You've never said, Jesus, just invade my life and take over my life. I want to live for you. I want to not live for myself. And today is that opportunity for you. So, Lord, we want to close by just saying, you're God and we're not. (laughs) You're God and we are not. You are Lord and we are not. You have the answers. We have lots of questions and we have our issues, but you are the solution. And Jesus Christ is enough, sufficient, not only sufficient, but supreme, as we're going to discover. But here, Lord, in considering these verses... Paul didn't write this just to be clever or cute or customary. He wrote this to convey the character of that church at peace because they've experienced the undeniable, undeserving, unmerited grace of God. I pray, Father, that we will turn over our anxieties to you, trust you with it, and walk away from it knowing it's in good hands. I pray for those who don't know you that they would get honest with you for a moment 
and turn their lives over to you. And if you've never done that, right now, would you just say, right where you are, you may be outside in the amphitheater, you might be watching this online, you might be here in our auditorium, just say, Lord, you know me. I want to know you. I admit I'm a sinner. I've fallen short. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on a cross. I believe he shed his blood for my sin and rose again from the dead. And I turn from my past and I turn to Jesus as my Savior and as my Master. Help me to live for you. Help me to experience your peace as I become aware of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.